To my knowledge, this is the first time we ran out of books. Uh, we've had many <laughs> book events before, but never did we run out of books for the author to sign. And Joe, it's a wonderful sign that <laughs> their admiration people have for you. So thank I just you, want to John. say thank you. Let me just say a few words of uh, introduction. By the way, what we're going to do, if you wanted a book but you weren't able to get it, we're going to send out to everybody a link where you can then just order one, okay? So we'll be able to get this taken care of for you. Uh, I just want to say a sincere thanks to all of you coming. This is, uh, uh, I've had a, the privilege of uh, talking with Joe about this book. I mean, of course, he's, it's kind of intimidating for a guy that's written so many books, and I'm still thinking about one. I haven't gotten that down yet. Uh, and a man who has probably done more to shape strategic thinking in the last 30 years in America. I mean, no one, no one exceeds Joe for that. And he's given us a new gift tonight, and that's this latest piece that he is, uh, where he's exploring, you know, the foundations of national power. And is the American century over? I think it's a, something that we all think a lot about. We talk to each other about it. And Joe, in his very typical and thoughtful way, has uh, explored the idea with discipline. And it's, uh, it's really good, and it's exciting. We're delighted to have him here. Let me just say uh, that uh, my name is John Hamry, uh, the president here at CSIS. I am the, when we have public events like this, we always give a little safety announcement. I am the, uh, I'm the responsible safety officer tonight, so if anything happens, you're going to follow my directions, okay? <laughs> Uh, we have our exits are right here. We've got three exits to go out. We're going to go out that way. The emergency stairs is over in that corner. We're going to rendezvous across the street at the Beacon Hotel, and I'll pay for drinks. Okay? <laughs> so we got a good idea, but follow me. All right? So, I, you know, if I were to spend any time trying to introduce Joe Nye, it would be a diminishment of the evening uh, because he is his own uh, personality. You all know it. That's why you are here. So I won't spend any further time in introducing Joe, but we are going to be listening to a remarkable man with some very interesting ideas. Would you please, with your warm applause, welcome Dr. Joe Knight. Thank you, John. I'm going to sit right there. Well, it's, it's nice to be back at CSIS. I, uh, it's an organization I deeply admire only exceeded by my admiration for John Hamry, who I work for as one of his trustees, but also on the Defense Policy Board. So I appreciate your being our host, John. Uh, let me say a few things about uh, uh, the argument of the book, but not. I don't want to go on for too long, partly because professors talk too long anyway, but because the be, most fun of these events is to have a degree of back and forth and questions and so forth. So um, if I'm too verbose, John, stop me. <laughs> okay. But I think the, uh, uh, the question of whether the American century is over is one that uh, has intrigued a lot of people, both here and in China. And uh, there is a conventional wisdom uh, that China is going to surpass the United States and end the American century. In fact, uh, if you look at a book by Martin Jock, uh, a British uh, author, the title tells it all. He says, when China rules the world, or my uh, Harvard colleague, uh, Neil Ferguson, uh, says the 21st century is the Chinese century. And a little bit earlier, this year, well, no, early, it's about a year ago, I should say, the uh, Financial Times had a headline which said that this was the year in which China had passed the United States. Um, I thought these ideas were wrong, and part of that's what's in the book, to try to understand uh, what the world will look like in 2041 which is 100 years after Henry Roos made his famous proclamation of the American century. Uh, so if you look at this, you can ask, well, why, why bother? I mean, it's, you know, who cares who's number one? Some people take this position. But the danger is if you don't understand power relations, if you make mistakes, you think you're stronger or weaker than you are, you can get policy wrong. 
And there's a long tradition in thinking about international relations. It says that when a rising power creates fear in an established power, that's the source of great conflict. This, of course, was the, the famous uh, explanation that Thucydides gave for the Peloponnesian War, which was the, uh, the event in which uh, the ancient Greek city-state system tore itself apart and ceased to be the center of the ancient world in the Mediterranean. And uh, Thucydides said it was caused by the rise in the power of Athens and the fear that created in Sparta. And many people said last year as we were celebrating the 100th anniversary of World War I, that World War I, in which the European state system tore itself apart and ceased to be center of the global balance of power, was caused by the rise in the power of Germany and the fear it created in Britain. Much too simple a view of the uh, causes of World War I, but it does indicate that when countries make mistakes about power relations or don't understand them, uh, it can have major consequences. And there is a view expressed by some, such as John Mearsheimer, a very distinguished political scientist at the University of Chicago, that says that China cannot rise peacefully, that, uh, that China and the United States are likely to have a conflict. If so, that's very bad news for our century. Um, it would be extraordinarily disruptive. And so the question of whether it's right that China is about to pass the United States and end the American century is a more, than, more important than just a matter of national pride. Now, let me start by looking at this question of whether the United States is in decline. Uh, one of the problems with the word decline is that we don't know what's the yardstick or what's the measure. People talk about it all the time, but um, if you look at a human organism, such as me, I can assure you I'm in decline. We rarely last more than 100 years. But if you look at a social artifact, which is what a country is, uh, we don't know what a life cycle looks like. There was a famous British journal, uh, uh, statesman of the 18th century, Horace Walpole, who, after Britain lost its North American co colonies, said, woe to us, we are now reduced to a miserable little island like Sardinia. And he said this just on the eve of Britain's second century, which is fueled by the Industrial Revolution. So when people say, well, the United States, you know, it's, it's over or so forth, how do you know? I mean, what, what is the life cycle of a country? And what would you know when you thought about decline? Just to give you an example how, how even very impressive, thoughtful people can get it wrong, Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon, often cited as the most thoughtful of the statesmen we've had in terms of understanding the big picture, in 1968 to 70 or so, they thought the United States was in decline and that the world was becoming multipolar. They talked about multipolarity all the time. Of course, by the end of the 20th century, the world was unipolar, not multipolar. Now, what happened? How did they get it wrong? Well, for one thing, the United States began and ended the 20th century with about a quarter of the world's economy. In between, after World War II, we went up to nearly half the world's economy because World War II strengthened the United States and weakened everybody else. So from the period from 1945 to 1970, indeed, the U.S. share of world product went from nearly 50% back down to 25%. And so in that sense, as Kissinger and Nixon looked at it, it was indeed decline. However, they extrapolated that curve as though it were going to continue. And in fact, it didn't. What it did is it flattened out and stayed at 25%. And in that sense, their view that we were in decline uh, didn't predict the way the century was going to end. So even very astute observers can make mistakes on this, which is a reminder that I too may be mistaken in what I'm saying. <laughs> 
but it helps to be self-aware as you make your mistakes. So I'm just warning. That's... Now, the other problem with decline, of course, is that it's a uh, confusing term in the sense that uh, uh, it can refer to absolute decline or relative decline, and they're not the same. For example, ancient Rome um, was absolute decline. Rome didn't succumb to the rise of another empire. It succumbed to hordes of barbarians. And the reason it succumbed to the barbarians is because it had no productivity in its economy and because it had internecine warfare. They were actually killing each other for power. We may be gridlocked for power, but we don't kill each other unless you watch House of Cards. Now, the, uh, in that sense, uh, the argument that people make that the United States is in absolute decline uh, has to be measured against the facts. And if you look at the facts, demographically, uh, we're the one rich country which will hold its position as the third largest country by the middle of this century. All the others, Europe, Russia, Japan, so forth, will be diminished in their demographic footprint. In energy, which everybody said a few years ago we were becoming hopelessly dependent on imported energy, the IEA now, the International Energy Agency now says that North America may be uh, having no oil imports in the 20s. Uh, if you look at research and development and new technologies, uh, if you look at the technologies that are going to be most important in this century, uh, let's think of uh, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and, and uh, information technology 3.0, um, the U.S. is generally in the forefront on all of these. If you look at the universities that underlie technologies, you look at the rankings that are done by, let's say, Shanghai Jiao Tung University, just so it's not a biased American view, uh, of the top 20 universities in the world, 15 are American, none are Chinese. Uh, and if you look at the nature of the culture in which this is embedded, an entrepreneurial culture with uh, rich capital markets which can take ideas and spread them into commercialization quickly, it's hard to beat the United States on this. So these comparisons of the United States with ancient Rome as though we're in absolute decline, I don't think make any sense. What's a little more interesting is the idea of relative decline. And in that sense, uh, we ended the 20th century with about a quarter of the world economy. And the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, now projects that the United States will probably be somewhere like 18% of the world economy by the, by the 2020s. Uh, projections like this are somewhat inaccurate. But if that's true, it would indicate some degree of relative decline. You could also, though, reframe that by saying it's the rise of the rest. It's the rise of China, India, Brazil, Indonesia, and so forth. And part of that has been an objective of American policy. So whether it's relative decline or the rise of the rest, it's still going to leave the United States as the largest of the major actors. And if you think about the role of the largest state in terms of leading in the production of public goods, the United States will still be crucial for that. So this is a prelude, this clarification of what absolute and relative decline mean. It's a prelude to the question of will China pass the United States and thereby end the American century? Uh, if you try to judge that, it's worth noticing that very often when people make these projections, they make the projections based just on extrapolating the growth rates of GDP, gross domestic product. Um, and that's not a very good way to calculate it uh, because we're not at all clear that Chinese growth rates are going to stay that high. In fact, they're probably going to diminish. Uh, but the point is that even if you do take these projections, 
you have to ask, if you're talking about passing the United States in power, you have to ask about all three dimensions of power. And power involves both economic power and military power, which I'd lump together as hard power, and soft power, the ability to attract others and get what you want through attraction and persuasion. And let's look at each of those in, in turn, but let me spend most time on economic power, because that's the one that gets the attention of the headline writers, such as the people who put this on the front page of the Financial Times a year ago. Well, the problem with the Financial Times headline is it was done in something called purchasing power parity, which is a good measure of welfare, but not of power. You don't import oil or jet engines in purchasing power parity. You import it in the exchange rate for dollars. And even so, at some point, if China, with 1.3 million people growing at some rate above 7% or around 7%, uh, doesn't stumble, and if the United States, with 350 million people and growing at about 2.5%, doesn't stumble, you would expect the lines to cross, that at some point, probably in the 20s, uh, China will have a larger overall economy in the US measured by exchange rates. Now, not everybody agrees with that. For example, Charles Wolf, an economist at RAND, has recently come out with an estimate in which he sees Chinese growth rates as lower, US growth rates as higher, and he says China won't pass the United States until 2050. I don't know. I mean, these are disputable uh, estimates. You put your, you plug in your, your uh, estimates about growth rates, and you'll get the, the answer you want. But the point is that even if China has a larger economy than the United States, let's say in the mid-20s, uh, in gross domestic product, size of the market is only one measure of power. It's an important measure of economic power. If I have a big market and I'm trading with you, and I deny you access to the market, as the Chinese did to the Norwegians over salmon, over Liu Xiaobo, then obviously that, uh, that's power. But it's not the only measure of power or economic power. Uh, you also want to know about the sophistication of an economy. And that is better measured by per capita income. And per capita income, the Chinese are only 20% of the United States. So even when they pass us overall in terms of total size of the economy, they won't be anything near us in per capita income. Now you say, well, what does that mean, sophistication of an economy? Well, one illustration of it is to, uh, is to think of the thing that most of us carry in our pockets, this thing, and uh, to say, what do we pay for this? Well, it costs us probably about $700 here, an iPhone. And then you say, where is it made? Well, made in China. And then you say, all right, how much of the $750 does China get? Well, the components are probably from Malaysia and Taiwan and elsewhere. The royalties for design are American. Uh, marketing is American. Turns out China gets only a few percent. So we import a product, and the trade statistics show this is $750 imports from China. In fact, in value added, it's, it's really mining Chinese labor to put together components and design and ideas that are from elsewhere. So it's not surprising that Chinese sometimes complain that uh, they're very good at producing jobs, J-O-B-S, but not Steve Jobs. <laughs> Someday they will, I mean, and they're working on it now. There's some brilliant Chinese entrepreneurs, Jack Ma is a case in point. But as of yet, their economy is not as sophisticated as ours. Another example of this would be money. People say, look, at China has $4 trillion in reserves. Uh, you know, this means that China is going to dominate world currency markets. Well, not of the money is not convertible, and not of there aren't deep and rich and liquid capital markets, and not if you have to worry about political interference in those markets. So if you say, do you want to hold Chinese yuan, or do you want to hold dollars, 
Uh, China has been making a major push to clear more trade in renminbi, yuan, but it's only about seven or eight percent, whereas the dollar is over 80 percent. And the difference is that people feel that there is a sophisticated financial market behind, and a rule of law, I should add, behind the dollar, which there's not yet behind the renminbi. Someday there will be. But the argument that, uh, that this economy is equal to the other economy, if you don't think about sophistication of the economy, you're making a, a, a mistake. I could go on with that, but I, I would simply note that, uh, to take us back to an earlier point, that this projection of China being more, having a larger market than the US by the 2020s depends upon a high rate of Chinese economic growth. And there is a, a, a question there, which is if you take previous countries that have had high rates of economic growth, remember Japan had 10% economic growth at one point. If you take those countries overall and you ask how long does it take to return to modest rates of economic growth, Larry Summers and Lant Pritchett have done an estimate in which they look at this experience of other high growth countries, and their estimate is that China would grow at about 3.9%, just on the statistics, not any particular things about China in uh, the next decade. Uh, some people think that's too low, others think it's too high, but what's interesting is that the projections that we have of the Chinese officially now say 7% is the new normal. I don't think so. It's going to, I think, be lower than that. In addition to that problem, you have the problem that China faces in terms of demography. Um, because of the one-child policy, uh, China's workforce, labor force, is peaking. And you're having more people in the next decade who will be either very old or very young, and the number of workers to support them goes down. And that leads the Chinese to say that they fear they may grow old before they grow rich. Yet another problem that they face is that they need to change the growth model. The export-led growth, which has been very successful for them so far, has to be replaced by a more domestic consumption-oriented growth, and they have to get away from imitating technology, whether it's stolen or purchased, and begin to develop the capacity to develop their own technologies. And they are making progress on this, but still have a long way to go. If they're not able to do that, then they'll run into what's sometimes called the middle income <coughs> trap, where essentially they do very well up to a point, but to get beyond that point, they have to develop this indigenous capacity for innovation. And Xi Jinping talks about this. He says that we have, the, uh, we have to make sure we don't fall in the middle income trap. It's easier to talk about it than it is to implement the policies to do something about it. And then finally, uh, China has a problem as we make these projections ahead of how is it gonna handle the difficulties or issues related to political participation. Uh, we know that when economies and societies reach a per capita income of around $10,000 per capita, that there are increased demands for political participation. If you're India, you're poorer, but you also inherited from the British a constitution which gives you a, a, a design to solve this problem. China hasn't figured out how you solve this problem. And I'm sure they'd, they'd like to have good answers, but they really haven't. And I don't think Xi Jinping or anybody knows the answer to this. So as we project ahead, there are not only statistical points I mentioned and the questions of how you evaluate, but there are also a lot of unknowns in the future of the Chinese economy. So when people say that China will pass the US in economic power, I say, maybe, I doubt it. Um, if you turn then to military power, uh, there you find that the US military expenditure is four times uh, Chinese military expenditure. And if you take accumulated capital goods, 
what we've purchased in the past. The ratio is more like 10 to 1 in the American favor. Um, now, China is investing, uh, at, uh, it's increasing its military budget in double digits for over a decade. And this means that it is increasing its capabilities. Um, they're probably going to show up primarily and first in regional capabilities rather than global capabilities. So the job that the US Navy has to protect allies and to have a presence in the South China Sea and the East China Sea is becoming more difficult. Not impossible, but more difficult as the Chinese capability grows. But is China going to be a military power to rival the US globally? Not very likely. Another way of thinking of this is that China is going to be importing more of its oil from the Middle East as the US imports less. And it's going to worry about sea lines and the increases in Chinese military investment may help with protecting sea lanes through the Straits of Malacca. I doubt they're going to be relevant in a significant way to the Straits of Hormuz. I suspect that will still be a need for American position there. So military capacity will increase. Uh, it'll give us more pressure. But I don't think you're going to see a China which equals or rivals the US as a global military power in the quarter century, which is the time horizon that I'm, I'm looking at. And then finally, let me turn to soft power, which is the ability to get what you want through attraction and persuasion rather than coercion or payment. Uh, China uh, has been making major efforts to increase its soft power. In, Hujin, in 2007, Hu Jintao told the 17th Party Congress of the Chinese Communist Party that China needed to increase its soft power. If you step back and think about that, that's a very smart strategy. If you're a country whose hard power, military and economic, is growing mightily, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to scare your neighbors into coalitions to protect themselves against you. But if you can combine that growth in your hard power with an increase in your soft power or attractiveness, you're less likely to frighten people and the coalitions are less likely to be as effective as they otherwise would be. So Hu Jintao's decision, or his advice to the party, and Xi Jinping has repeated it, to invest in soft power, has led to the expenditure of billions of dollars to create things like Confucius Institutes, or things like uh, uh, the uh, turning CC Chinese Central Television into a sort of an Al Jazeera global station, and, Xinhua doing the same thing. Um, and I think that's interesting, but the Chinese are not getting that good a return on their investment. Chinese polls show, polls taken by the BBC or Pew and so forth, reputable polling sources, show that Chinese soft power attractiveness goes up in Africa, somewhat in Latin America, but not in Asia and not in Europe or North America. And you say, well, why is this? Well, I think there are two reasons that uh, determine that and which China would have to overcome if it really wants to equal the United States in soft power. One is China has to unleash its civil society. A lot of American soft power or European soft power comes not from government broadcasting. It comes from essentially foundations, universities, Hollywood, cultural uh, industries, and so forth. China, with Communist Party control, is very loath to give the freedom to these aspects of civil society, which is, unleashes their full creativity. And the other problem that China has is, if you look at uh, nationalism and disputes with neighbors, China has, in particularly in the coastal areas, but also with India on the Himalayan borders, has disputes. And because of rising nationalism in China, which is helping to legitimize the Communist Party and may become more important as economic growth rates slow, uh, it's very hard for them to compromise. So it's one thing to put up a Confucius Institute in Manila to attract people to the uh, the true glories of traditional Chinese culture. But it's hard for Philippine uh, consumers of this culture 
to feel warm toward China if China is chasing Philippine fishing boats out of Scarborough Shoal at the same time. And we saw the same thing in Vietnam when the oil rig was parked within the area that Vietnam considers its exclusive economic zone, which led to anti-Chinese riots. Um, so you say, well, why doesn't China see this? Why doesn't it accommodate this why, and smooth it over? And my Chinese friends tell me that because at home, there's a quite fierce competition about who is more nationalistic than whom. And so if you become somebody who says, let's do this peacefully, uh, you're going to lose your bureaucratic competition at home. So until China is able to unleash its civil society and find ways to manage these uh, disputes without uh, the nationalistic overlay they have now, then I think that um, uh, China is going to uh, uh, lag behind in soft power as well. So I would say that in all three dimensions of power, economic power as measured by sophistication as well as size, military power looked at globally as well as regionally, and soft power considering both the civil society and, and territorial nationalism disputes, I don't think China is going to pass the United States in overall power. I once uh, um, had a lunch with Lee Kuan Yew a few years ago. He and I sat on a uh, European company board at the same time, and having lunch with him was one of the real treats of going to these uh, board meetings. And I asked him, uh, what did he think? Was China going to pass the United States in this century or not? And he said, no, he said, I think they're going to give you a real run for your money. But he said, I don't think they're going to pass you. And I said, well, why? He said, well, China can draw upon the talents of 1.3 billion people. He said, but the US can draw upon the talents of 7 billion people. And what's more, it can recombine them with a diversity which leads to much more creativity than you can ever get with ethnic Han nationalism. This, of course, by an ethnic Han. And uh, I think there's something in that. So long as the United States keeps its openness uh, and doesn't succumb to fear or hubris, I think that uh, Lee Kuan Yew is probably right. So to conclude this, let me say that um, if I go back to this opening question, of, is it the Chinese century? Will it end the American century? Is it going to produce a, a result like Germany and Britain did 100 years ago? No, I don't think so. One thing that's worth noticing is that Germany had already passed Britain in industrial production by 1900. So Germany was really on the heels of passing Britain. And the British felt that. If my analysis is correct, then China's not about to pass us. And if that's correct, then we have time to manage this relationship. So we don't have to succumb to fear and overreaction. And my great worry is that when people talk about decline, talk about the century over, they generate fear and anxieties which create the wrong types of policies. We can manage the problems of China, and China creates a number of problems. But it also creates opportunities and things where we can benefit from working with China. International financial stability, managing climate change, managing the rise and control of pandemics, handling transnational terrorism. All these are areas where we in China can find common cause at the same time that we may be disputing territorial limits in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. So we're going to have to learn to have both cooperation and competition with China at the same time. But if we come too much to fear, because we fear that we're in decline, or if the Chinese believe this, we could get policies that could mess up what otherwise is a relation which can be managed. So that's part of what I was trying to get at by writing this book, which summarizes some thinking that I've been doing about America's role in the world for a, a much longer time than the, than the mere 130 or 40 pages in the book, uh, say. But I think the message about how do we think of America's role in the world, in particular, how do we relate 
to the country that's most likely to challenge or seem challenging to us, I think it's a message that policymakers need to take seriously. So thank you all for your attention. Okay. Joe, thank you very much. This was uh, a splendid recounting of your book, and uh, I know there are going to be many questions from the audience, but I'm just going to get things started, if I may, and let me just, let me just begin by say, asking a question. Um, how much does this, uh, our tortured domestic politics, shape international perceptions of America's power? Well, it's a good question, and I think uh, uh, too much is <laughs> the short answer. I mean, we, uh, we often damage ourselves by, uh, by making us look weaker or dumber than we are. Now, that's hard, but uh, if you take this uh, uh, Asian International Investment Bank, uh, Brolio, where we uh, decided that people shouldn't join this Chinese bank, uh, People, there were a number of headlines in Asia saying this was a sign of American decline. They said, no, it's just a sign of American stupidity, and we've done stupid things for centuries. I mean, what we should have said is let this bank go forward, but make sure that it's a transparent international institution. So if the British and the Germans and others join it, there's much more likelihood that it'll be held to a certain accounting standards, that there'll be less Chinese corruption in it, and the idea that we would have spent political capital to try to stop it was just dumb. So now, and behind that was the fact that when we agreed in 2010 to increase quotas for China and other emerging markets in the IMF, the Congress didn't pass it. Four years that we've been sitting on this, which again is dumb. It doesn't cost us much of anything but it becomes wrapped up with issues of sovereignty and control and so forth. Or take the Law of the Sea Treaty, which you can have as many chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and former secretaries of state and defense come and testify that this is in our interest, and we go out and preach in East Asia that China should obey the Law of the Sea Treaty, and then they say, excuse me, have you ratified that? No. Why? Because the majority of the American people don't want it? No. Does a majority of the Senate not want it? No. A few senators decide that it's an affront to our sovereignty. So we do a lot of really dumb things in our domestic political uh, disputes and institutions, which I think does diminish our power below what it otherwise would be. Joe, let me just dig down then, because it, it, it seems we do have a challenge when we're a representative democracy, it's bottom up. It's hard to get a sense of national conviction and purpose if we don't have an enemy that seems to focus us. But it's pretty pathetic to think that we need enemies to get our poop in a group as a nation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's right. And, and I, I do worry that we're going to create an enemy in China because we feel we need one. I don't. I mean, if my analysis is correct, we don't need a Chinese enemy. China will cause us problems, but so do other countries. But we need, China is not like Nazi Germany or not like Stalin's Russia. It's not an existential threat to us, and it's not about to pass us. And in that case, we can be more relaxed and don't have to put them in that enemy's role. But as you said, if we don't have them, who's gonna do it? You know, the Chinese will say, quite openly, that managed democracy is more efficient than a popular democracy. Um, how do you think this is going to play out? Well, I think uh, that's a great phrase for the Chinese to use until you realize how rampant the corruption is there and how, how if I'm correct, that they're going to have a problem with, uh, with managing this grand, this demand for participation as per capita income reaches $10,000. I think the, uh, th that slogan isn't gonna sound so good. Uh, I mean, for all our problems, the United States still has the capacity for change. And even, even you know, for the problems of gridlock, when people say that we're worse than ever, 
Well, not necessarily. Remember, Thomas Jefferson opposed George Washington's treaty with England, the Jay Treaty, and worked with the Congress to try to defund it. So we've been doing this for a long time. But, uh, but more to the point, even if you say, well, there's a trend, a downward trend since the 1970s or 80s, it's worth remembering that Obama's first Congress passed health care, whether you like it or don't like it, but they passed it, and passed a stimulus bill uh, and uh, changed the position of gays in the military. There are a lot of major changes. This is not a stagnant society. In the meantime, health care costs have declined. The economy's recovered. Unemployment's at 5.5%. And a lot of the strength of this country is not just in Washington. It's, it's around the country. So if you ask me, would I rather play the political hand of Washington for all its faults or the political hand of Beijing, I'd much rather have the, the Washington political hand. Joe, the, um, we're coming up on sometime this spring or summer uh, to move on TPP, the trade uh, from Trans-Pacific Partnership. Big, big uh, regional free trade agreement type thing with uh, principles underlying it is the goal. Um, the narrative that's being used in Washington by the administration is that if, if this is about who choose, who sets the rules, does China set the rules for trade or do we set the rules? Now that, that might be the way we should talk about it in the United States, but that must sound pretty weird overseas. Do you have a thought on this? Well, I think the Chinese uh, often will bring that up. If we, if they say, is your rebalancing toward Asia containment? We say no. They say, then why are we, why is TPP aimed against us? I think the answer to that is, the proper answer to that is that we should be willing to have Chinese participation. And I think the administration has said so when China is able to live to those standards. So if you think of it as open-ended trade agreements, open-ended in the sense that they're not permanently exclusive, excluding others, then, uh, then it's more understandable. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just step back. One last question. I'm going to turn to all of you. Uh, this is more of a, it's not really from your book, Joe, but you're the kind of intellect that would give us all perspective and insight on it. You know, one of the great problems about being the world's only superpower and being, and having to deal with regional superpowers is that we have to integrate four and five and six crises simultaneously whereas our regional competitors worry about one or two. Do we have the attention span as a nation to be a global superpower? I, I think it's hard. I mean, if you, look at, at, um, uh, if you look at the Bush administration, friends of mine who, who were in the Bush administration say that uh, it wasn't a deliberate neglect of Asia. It's just that every time you went to a uh, to the Situation Room, the agenda was something to do with Afghanistan and Iraq. And it just ate up the time of top-level people. And you can increase the bureaucracy, but a top-level decision-maker has only 24 hours in his day. And Obama and his team came in talking about uh, a rebalancing toward Asia, which is a better word than pivot, which is always a, a, not a very good word because it means turning away from other things. Uh, but if you looked at John Kerry's uh, address book, or not his address book, his travel log, you, you wouldn't ask whether this is a, uh, a rebalancing toward Asia. I mean, he's obviously been absorbed by, by the Middle East. It may be the right decision, but if you ask, can we uh, do both at the same time, it's very hard with it at the top level, this time of top level decision makers. Forgive me, one last question. And I know you haven't had a chance to study this yet, Joe, but it looks like there was a, fair, a surprisingly detailed agreement with Iran. Um, I think it's all too fresh for us to really know what we think yet about it. But do you have a, an initial impression? Well, I, again, I, I would like to see what it meant. I mean, I just have what I received on my iPhone this afternoon. But I think the, if you say the major options um, were uh, to try to reach an agreement which would keep 
Iran 10 year, like a year away from nuclear weapons um, uh, th with, a, with a detailed inspection regime and so forth versus just continuing the sanctions, but during the sanctions, the Iranians keep building centrifuges versus the Bolton option of bomb Iran, which buys you maybe one year, three years, but then they go back and do the same thing again. I think of those three abstract options, number one is, is the best. Um, but I, I think we do want to, I mean, before making a final decision, I'd like to see what they, what they decided on some of the, uh, the oh. details. Joe, sure, thank you. Let me open up the floor here. Let, let me, let me, let's just start with you uh, in, that, in your kind of a dusty pink sweater. Would you please, yeah. uh, it's, the microphone's coming over to you, right there. Yeah, one question I have is that in China, there are hundreds of different languages and dialects, whereas in the United States, almost everybody speaks English. Does that make any difference to how well China can do in the future? having so many different languages and dialects? Well, I think dialects uh, do provide a problem of sorts in China, but they've been pretty, pretty able to overcome that. I don't think that's a, a major problem. I think more of a problem is how they're gonna deal with minorities in Xinjiang and, and Tibet, uh, which is more than just a linguistic problem. It's, it's how will they be integrated. Uh, so I, I wouldn't focus as much on the language part of it as the as the minorities part. Sherm Katz. Uh, I don't have that off the top of my head. Doug Paul probably knows. Yeah. Sherm Katz, why don't we bring a microphone over to you. Thank you very much, Professor Nye. I'd like to bring you back to John Hamry's first question about the domestic political situation my good fortune to have read the book. Page 91 of the book, you talk about the fact that... You're, you've done your homework. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you mentioned that uh, often political partisan gridlock in Washington is accompanied by innovation in states. Uh, I wonder how you think about that now, particularly as we look at sort of the cultural wars that seem to be moving from Washington to the states, there seems to be as much gridlock or more in the states. Leave California aside, that's a special case. <laughs> well, I, I, there are culture war problems, and they do go uh, across the states. You know, Louis Brandeis, Justice Brandeis, said the states are the laboratories of this democracy, that you can try things there. So if you take, uh, take if you say culture wars, yeah, that spreads. It's like a fever or something. but. If you take a, a question like, how do you get more accurate or more representative congressional districts, which uh, right now, because of the uh, terrible way in which we uh, reapportion districts every 10 years, you have so many safe seats that a Republican has to make sure he has no uh, you know, competition to the right, and a Democrat must make sure she has no competition to the left. And the net effect of that is a, that the parties are further apart than the American public is. Well, there are two states which actually are doing something about that. One is California with non-partisan primaries. Another is Iowa with uh, you know, a truly independent redistricting commission. So that's an example of, of, of you know, the, these laws of, of RIFRA being reproduced in the states. Actually, that I think is less important than these efforts to Re rethink how you do the, the, uh, the way we elect our representatives, because that is what I think is creating the, uh, some of the extreme uh, partisanship. Just sure, one, follow up, one follow up, if I may. Well, one, I may turn it down. Uh, uh, you can go ahead and try. All right, Soft Power. You gave a talk in 2004 at CSIS about your new book then, Soft Power. And presumably you still grade papers now and then. I wonder, would you share your thought process I'm talking about how the Obama administration has used the tools of soft power in foreign policy. Well, I, I think Obama has tried, and it's worked in some areas and not others. If you look at Obama's speech in Cairo in June of 2009, that was a major effort to 
attract uh, uh, Arab people by soft power. I don't think it's worked very well because it, it turns out that that uh, what you do is more important than what you say. So in, in that sense, I, I, I think I give them credit for trying. In some areas, they've done better than others. But not uh, this that. gentleman that was right next to Sherm, I promised him. So we'll make a... Thank you. Uh, this month, uh, my uh, it's 70 years since my father was freed from Buchenwald, my father Polish soldier, by the Americans. And a year ago, looking at the swimming pool instructions where I live, I saw 27 different type of instructions, which among others forced us to go out of the pool every half hour to do a little chemical test on the quality of water. And I told my wife, this is not the United States that would have freed my father. There has been some risk aversion that has been intrusive getting into the system more and more. Do you have any comment on that? Well, uh, I, th I and over over regulation, I think is a, is a problem, and uh, uh, it, it's you know there have been efforts both. I mean, uh, if you look at the uh, early days of the of the Obama administration, my colleague from Harvard, Cass Sunstein, was given the specific job of going through regulations and trying to see what ones you could get rid of. And they did get rid of a number of them. So we should be constantly thinking of ways in which you can reduce regulations which are not functional. But doing that cost-benefit analysis to make sure that you're throwing out the bathwater and not the babies, that's, that's a hard job. Uh, Jan Lodel. Thanks, John. Let me say to the last question, if you move to Virginia, we don't have those regulations out there, so <laughs> pools are okay. Uh, Joe, I, I'd like to turn to the hardest of hard power, nuclear. Uh, you talked about the Iranians a little bit, but what about the Chinese and the Americans and the Russians? Uh, you know, if the Spartans and the Athenians were nuclear powers, maybe it would have come out different. How does that play? Does that kind of ensure that we never have the kind of a big war that would be the worst case outcome for uh, China and America, or does it add a risk in there? And of course, the Russians still maintain the biggest nuclear arsenal, so that uh, adds another question in there. So I'll leave it at that. Well, I think there still is nuclear risk, and it, and it, it takes constant attention, as you've spent much of your career uh, doing. Uh, but there is also another effect that uh, I, I once called the crystal ball effect, which in, in uh, 1914, if you've given the Kaiser, the Tsar, and the Emperor a little crystal ball and said, here's a picture of 1918, and look inside it, you'll see your empire is dismembered, you'll see that you've lost your throne, and you've lost tens of millions of your people, do you still want to go to war? I suspect they would have said not, and nuclear weapons provide that crystal ball. Now, that doesn't mean people can't drop a crystal ball and shatter it, doesn't mean people can't miscalculate, doesn't mean that uh, North Koreans will look into it crystal ball the same way we look into it and so forth. But I think there is something in this uh, crystal ball effect which makes people more prudent about war. Doesn't mean it's impossible. And that's why we have to, to be continually alert and aware of it. But uh, it's the, the, the nuclear factor is, is gonna be with us for some time. Joe, can I give you a very awkward question? Does global zero make sense? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I don't, it, I mean, it, Sam Nunn is a great friend of mine, and I admire him. Uh, it, it, or if, you, if it makes sense, it's what I call aspirational rather than instrumental a policy goal. But I, if, in the near term of the kind of period I was talking about of a quarter century, I, I don't think so. I think in fairness to Nunn and Kissinger, Schultz and Perry, they outlined uh, step by step. They did yeah. not embrace global zero, but a bit that campaign. Right. Uh, the gentleman over here in the white, in the yellow tie, uh, Daria, right here, uh, first table. He's been very persistent. Well, thanks so much, uh, Spencer Boyer from the National Intelligence Council. Thanks so much for your comments and for your service to the NIC. Uh, I wondered if you could talk just a little bit about global talent and uh, how you see that uh, affecting American power in the coming decades. 
often people will point to the United States, Canada, perhaps a couple of other countries uh, as being a uh, being countries that do attract very strong global talent, not just because of our economic and educational uh, strength, but because there's a perception that uh, we're welcoming cultures for the most part that uh, immigrants can assimilate into uh, and that their children will have good opportunities as well. Um, other countries, such as Germany, uh, many in Europe, are, are trying to do more to create uh, that perception. I was wondering, first of all, do you agree with that? Uh, and secondly, do you think that uh, others are making up ground on the United States in terms of being that, uh, that attractive power? Thanks. I, I, the point of my quoting Lee Kuan Yew was that this is one of the great strengths of the United States, that we can take talented people from all over the world and when we try to stop that, uh, we hurt ourselves. I mean, we, it, we are a nation of immigrants. Um, as Franklin Roosevelt once told the daughters of the American Revolution uh, to their chagrin. Um, the, uh, the point is that our strength, every generation complains about the next generation coming in. Uh, you know, in the 19th century, you had the Know Nothing Party, which didn't want the Irish Catholics, and within a century we had an Irish Catholic president. And you know, we, we, this capacity to, to assimilate, to give people opportunities to use talent is I think one of our great strengths. And I, I think, I mean, Australia does it, Canada does it, and so forth, but of the large developed countries uh, in Europe or Russia and so forth, they don't have that capacity. So this. This is in Japan, I put in the same uh, problem. Daria, we're going to take one last question right here. This uh, gentleman, yeah, stand up. She's got the microphone right behind you. Nope, snuck up. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, Tom O'Donnell, I work in energy and international affairs, and I, uh, now I'm teaching in Berlin. Um, as you're going through your analysis, uh, your analysis of China, very systematically, the aspects to look at, the, you could also apply these issues to the United States. You know, the, what are the elements of empire? A few years ago, people would have talked about it perhaps this way. What struck me is, uh, could you talk briefly about applying the same uh, categories and analysis to the European or to Europe? If anything, there now there is a place that's had the Industrial Revolution, had these transformations and so forth, but is obviously lacking in certain uh, depth in certain ways. Uh, could that be the rival uh, to the United States in the in the future? Uh, in principle, it could. The European economy, when Europe acts as an entity, which is sometimes, um, is equal to the United States. Uh, but the problem is it often has trouble acting as an entity on a lot of issues. And um, it also has a severe demographic problem over the long term. And it also has a severe energy problem in terms of, of how it manages the energy resources it has. And so all those things, I think, would make me rank the Europeans as less likely to be a global competitor. With that said, we have a strong interest in Europe doing well. So there's no other part of the world with whom we share more values than Europe. So we should, we should be rooting for Europe to overcome this current period of doldrums because we need them as a partner. Well, I, I, I've had the pleasure of knowing Joe for 20, 25 years, and it's always been so refreshing to have a, a, a colleague who speaks in such calm and rational terms. He always convinces me, I must say. And, and I, just, I just wish our public debate had this level of civility and common sense. Would you, with your applause, please thank Joe for this speech?